As with the discussion with the Samaritan woman at the well, and that the events that transpired there with that woman carry with them a great deal of spiritual application as John records for us these different signs and these different miracles that John himself will write and say that these things are being recorded for very specific events or specific purposes I should say. And so with Jesus healing the nobleman's son in John chapter 4 that is not all that this section is about. But that John gives us specific record of events that Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not give us. And that these are recorded, John chapter 20 and verse 30 tells us, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. We've made mention on how that John refers to the miracles as signs. Signs direct us to something else. They're pointing to another element. And thus, as we're going through this material, we're needing to realize that about the miracles that are being performed. This is not just an account that's recorded for us of, well, Jesus performed this miracle. What is the meaning, what is the significance behind the recording of this miracle? You have those in the first century. There are many that believed the miracles, but they did not believe the message of that miracle. And many believed the miracle without believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that He gives eternal life. And that as many will read John chapter 4, and they'll get honed in on, well, this is where Jesus performs the miracle of healing the Son. Yes, that's true, but why? What else is there? There's a whole conversation that takes place between Jesus and this nobleman. And yet everybody wants to get infatuated and hone in on, well, He, he performed a miracle. You're missing the message. And we have studied the contrast of that attitude between what is seen in John chapter 2 and John chapter 3. Jesus performed many miracles in Judea and many people came out to see the miracles, but many people were not willing to confess Him as being the Messiah. And there is something else being taught to us by this sign. And that's what we want to study today. Today we want to study about being a nobleman in Christ. Now this is something that has fallen far from our vocabulary and our everyday usage because we really don't have this breakdown in our society as would have been the case under the Jewish society and even that in the time of 1611 of King James having the Bible written for us. But a nobleman carries with it the idea of an aristocrat, a lord, or a ruler. But that's not what we're wanting to focus in on today. As far as being a part of an upper class of people when it comes to material status or physical status. But we're wanting to carry our view, study today, what it is to be noble. That's what we're wanting to study. 
And the definition of a person who is noble is the idea of possessing outstanding qualities. Possessing outstanding characteristics or character. Arising from superiority of mind or character or in ideals or of morals. And that what we will see with this nobleman in John chapter 4 is that that's exactly what he had. He was a man of outstanding character and of superior moral quality and that he would fall in the same category as what's talked about in Acts 17.11 of the Bereans and that they were more noble than those of Thessalonica and that they received the word with readiness of mind but then searched the scriptures daily as to whether those things were so. That's a noble character of being slow to speak, quick to listen. So when we go to our text in John chapter 4 and verse 46, here's what we have being laid out for us. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. If you remember from our classes, he's been in Jerusalem for the feast day. Leaving Jerusalem, he's gone to Samaria. And in being in Samaria, he stayed in Samaria two days. After those two days, Jesus returns to Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. So Jesus already has a reputation in this town. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. One of the first things we want to consider with this nobleman is not his social status or his material wealth that would put him into the category as being a ruler. But here are these spiritual qualities that this nobleman has that we want to have in our own lives so that we can be able to receive the same or similar blessings as to what he received. And the first thing that we note of this man's noble character is that he comes to Jesus, but the reason why he comes to Jesus is because he has a need. This man is in dire straits. And that he recognizes that what he needs no mere man could fix. That he had a son that was sick unto death. And this is what we need to learn from this nobleman so that we may be like him. What is it that is being taught to us by this sign? And the lesson that's being taught is that all mankind is sick unto death. That while his son was sick unto death physically, mankind is sick unto death spiritually. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we're told, for the ways of sin is death. That is what we are all facing as a consequence of sins that end up being committed. So what is it that all of mankind is needing? They're needing the same thing that this nobleman is needing. There's healing. Redemption. And this nobleman realizes nobody else can help but Jesus. And so he goes to find him. How is it that we are wanting to receive healing from God for our sins, you must first recognize that you need help. That was the problem with the Jews. The Jews did not think they needed any help. And so when Jesus comes to town, they did not appreciate him. The same situation with the Samaritans. They knew to some degree that they needed help. And so all of the city came out to listen to him and had Jesus stay for two days. And now here's this man. 
He needed help of something that only God could help with. And so he had to come to him. That's where all of this must begin for all of us. We want to have this noble character, then we need to have full recognition and realization of who we are. And he did not let his social status keep him back from going after Jesus. Well, here I am, this ruler, this strong and mighty individual in the community. I'm not going to go chase this man. He can come to me. It's not his mentality. And it's because of the need. But what this also teaches us is how it is that God expects effort on our part to come and to receive what it is that God is offering. Read this, let's read this again. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And notice this about the nobleman. The nobleman is not in the same city that Jesus is in. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, if you remember from John 2, we already laid this out on the map. Jesus has already made this travel before. Jesus' ministry starts out here in Capernaum. That's where his home base is and that he goes to Cain of Galilee for a wedding feast. This man travels 18 miles. To come and see the Savior. To come and see the Messiah. Now whether this is by foot that he's traveling, I don't know. Very likely, being a nobleman, a man of means, using a chariot, or he's got some type of beast of burden to be able to ride on. But either way, 18 miles under those kind of conditions... It's not an easy thing. It's not like us being able to hop in our car to go from here to Polson, which is 20 miles. And we're in comfort. And we're able to go 70 miles per hour, depending on how you drive. This is no little thing for him. But here's the question. With how so many people... Think about how it is that God blesses people and how it is that salvation is brought to us with no strings attack, attached. There's nothing that you have to do so as to obtain what it is that God is offering. Then why didn't this nobleman just stay home and pray for it? He already knows who Jesus is. He lives in the same town where Jesus' headquarters is. He already, it's, and it's evident that this man already has faith because he's coming to Jesus in the first place. And yet, with the faith that he already has, it was not adequate to have his son be healed. Why not send a servant to go and ask Jesus, make this request before the Savior? Because it's the same situation as in Matthew chapter 8 with Jesus and the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion recognized, or recognizes, and he recognized, with him being in leadership, there's always somebody that's over you. And that with this nobleman going through all of this, this is an expression of his submission. That yes, I am somebody in the community, but that does not change the fact that here is someone that's greater than me. And he sets aside all of his status, all of his standing, and he makes the 18-mile trip. To find the Savior.
Jesus himself will, will teach. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me. Everybody expects Jesus to come to them. But Jesus has already made the trip from heaven to earth. Jesus has already made the trip from Jerusalem, Samaria. Now he's here in Galilee. You can travel 18 miles to come see me. The teaching is, you come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God expects effort on our part. He expects us to meet him. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what's also important to remember or to notice about this event is that the nobleman did not go to Jesus with an idea that he deserved this in some type of way. Well, Jesus, I've traveled all this way. I've made this 18-mile trip. You owe me. There's no way. There's no how that this man <clears throat> would come with that kind of attitude when he already recognized how great of a need there was for his son. And when we are starting at that realization, Matthew 3, poor in spirit, when we come to Christ broken, what did I say? Oh, excuse me, Matthew 5, 3. Did I do it again? Okay, all right. <clears throat> when we come to Christ with that recognition that we are broken and that we have a need, Is there anywhere that's too far that we would not be willing to go to find that fulfillment? And then all of a sudden when we get there, our mentality, it shifts and it switches from being broken to now, well, you owe me. When we recognize how great of a need we have, that removes any idea of deserving or earning anything. But that even what is presented here by what Jesus is teaching, it's full recognition. Okay, if I come to him, then here's what I can expect. I don't deserve that. I'm not earning anything. He's offering this to me before I've even started the journey. And if I have that recognition, like, man, I need that rest. And he just says, okay, come. The invitation is there. Jesus is offering something and he says to all of us, come and take it. Now, the deserving attitude says, no, I'm going to stay right here and you can just give it to me. And that really is the mindset of the denominational world around us. God says, here's what I want you to do so as to be saved. But the denominational world says, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to sit here and you can just give it to us. That is a self-righteous attitude. They would say, no, we don't have to do that. We have his word right here. He can just give it to us. They would not be willing to travel 18 miles to hear Jesus tell them what they needed to hear.
but that's what makes this nobleman noble. That's why we have the record of him that we do. He came to Christ to hear what he had to say. And for us today, we do not have to travel 18 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles, or 100 miles to have to hear what Jesus has to say. We have his words right here at our fingertips. We can pick up this Bible and read and hear what Jesus has to say at any moment, at any time of the day. Do we take the time to listen? Do we really take the time to stop and to consider, to put in the effort as this man did? I'm going to travel 18 miles. Well, let me take 18 minutes and just read from the Bible. That's a noble character. That's noble quality. And that is what Christ is looking for. You drop down verse 48. We have another lesson that's being presented to us. <clears throat> that is teaching us about this man's character and what we're needing to have. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Jesus is throwing a test at him. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. This man may think that Jesus literally has to be there. But that's a lesson for us. That's a point for all of us to take from this. The test is being set before this man. You know, I'm already dealing with a bunch of people and they get fixated and they get caught up on these signs and unless there's a sign, they're not going to believe. But we're going to find that that's not the case with this nobleman. But what's being taught for us from the, or from the statement of the nobleman is a question of this man's faith. Will this man have the right kind of faith? And it's the kind of faith that accepts Jesus at his word. Because even though he may, the nobleman makes the statement, you know, come down and save my child. The literal presence of Christ is not necessary for his blessings. And that's an important point. Because if that were the case, if that is true, that in order for Jesus to bless or give blessing, he's got to be literally in that space, then we would be hopeless today. Because Jesus is in heaven now. He's not here on this earth. He's not here to be able to travel place to place bringing healing. And we've already studied from our reading through the book of John that Jesus is already early in his ministry and he's already beginning to tell people, I'm going to die. And that this is in connection with that same teaching that even though I'm going to leave this earth, the power to bless and the power to forgive is still going to be available. And that from this event with the nobleman, we are reminded that he does not need to be with us literally physically to bless us. And even Paul 
will illustrate that point for us when he writes to the Ephesian church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's peace, grace, coming from the Father, from the Lord. Well, how can that be? They're not here with us. They don't have to be. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Christ does not have to be here literally to give us spiritual blessings. And that's what he was teaching to these people at this time. I don't have to be in your physical location to give you the blessing. So we have similar teaching as to what's going on with the Samaritan woman. I don't have to be in the temple to bless you. You do not have to be in this mountain or that mountain to receive my blessing. But there is a location that matters. And that location is if I am in him. Jesus does not have to be here. I need to be in him. And there are things that are given to Christians that are not available to people living in sin out in the world that are not in Him. But we'll have more to say on that a little bit later on. But as to what is being emphasized for these individuals and what's being emphasized for us today, when we're thinking about spiritual blessings that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, what it is that they are wanting to offer for us. Acts 13, 37, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. We're speaking of Jesus. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. This is a spiritual blessing. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. This is the need of every man and of every woman. While the world would say, well, Jesus, you come to me and give that to me. Nope. Jesus says, you come to him. And you will find it in him. Well, a person might say, well, I know I need to see this first. I need to see something take place before I can have confidence that this is actually going to happen. Well, let's go back to the nobleman right quick. Verse 50. Jesus saith unto him, so this is after the nobleman says, Sir, come with me down to my house and save my son. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Here we have another test of faith. Now, the man already has faith. We've established that. But yet, his son still is not healed. He had faith to go and find Jesus. He had faith to even ask Jesus for help. And now Jesus says, go home. Your son is fine. There's not a sign given to this man. No miracle is performed. Now, what if the man had stayed behind and tried to argue with Jesus? What would have happened to his son? No, Jesus, this is what I need you to do. 
this is my understanding of how this is supposed to work. His son wouldn't have been healed. His son would have died. So here's the point. Will you simply accept the word of Jesus without having some kind of rebuttal of how you perceive it to be or how you think that it should be or how you want it to be? This nobleman, his faith rested on what Jesus said. Jesus saith unto him. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken. How many people claim to believe what Jesus says, but they really don't? They really do not believe. No, Jesus, I need you to do it this way. If the man had done anything else besides going back home, he would not have faith. So what we're learning here is the very point and the very principle that we were studying in John chapter 1, moving into John chapter 2, about the kind of faith that saves. And how that we studied all those different Greek scholars about what it means to receive him. What it means to believe on him. And how that they were all in agreement that this is discussing a continual action of faith. But the fact remains that faith must take action. Okay, the man had faith that Jesus could heal, but what if he stayed home? That's a dead faith. That's a faith without works. He makes the 18-mile trip, but then he doesn't ask Jesus what he wants to ask. His faith stops at that point. That's a faith without works. Now you've asked, and here's what Jesus says. What if he had ignored it? What if he had stopped? His son wouldn't have been healed. But the man went home in full assurance. In full trust, in full faith of what Jesus spoke. Without a miracle. Without having any confirmation of what Jesus said had actually happened. Jesus just said to him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. The man didn't argue. He did not question. All right, I believe you. And he went home. All throughout this, we have faith that is being expressed. And while our denominational friends would try to say, well, you know, you see there, that kind of proves our point that works don't produce faith, but faith produces works. As though there's any wit of difference between those two statements. You still have faith and works together. While their whole entire point is you're saved without any type of work. The man could have gone. He could have done all these things and he could have done it without faith. And guess what? There would have been no healing. The man could have had all the faith in the world and just stayed home and not done any of this. There would not have been any healing. It's only when the faith and the work go together that faith becomes alive. And it brings what God has to offer. Here with the nobleman we have faith that is expressed. Faith that is worked. That is tested. 
Okay, you say that you believe me? Your son's alive, go home. In verse 51, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend, and they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. The word was already spoken. The word was believed. The miracle was simply a confirmation of it all. Jesus spoke, the man obeyed, the thing was done. So when we're reading these things, we need to make sure that we are reading these things so as to study these things and to learn these elements. To be like this nobleman, and to simply trust in these words that Jesus has spoken. There's the message behind the sign. There is not any question to what Jesus said from this nobleman. And he walked away from Jesus that day in full assurance what he said was true. Now, how many people claim to have that kind of belief at Jesus' word, but then you take them to passages like Mark 16, 15, and 16, and they want to argue with Jesus? He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Most people that claim to have faith in Jesus will not accept Jesus at his word here. There are preachers all over this valley that will argue with Jesus. They will try to explain away what Jesus says here. Well, well baptism isn't a part of the gospel. Oh, really? If I'm reading Jesus correctly, he says in preaching the gospel, you're going to preach baptism. That shows a lack of noble character. But if we want to be in the same category as this nobleman, then we need to have that same attitude. This is what Jesus says. I believe it. I trust it. And can you not see how difficult it would be for that nobleman to go home? Well, Jesus, you haven't even done anything. You've not laid hands, you've not prayed, you've not offered any sacrifice, you've not done anything. Go home, it's taken care of. And the same type of questioning steps in for most of our religious friends. I just don't see what getting into water has to do with sin on my soul. You can either trust Jesus or you can't. And while many people may have faith that Jesus is who he is, they still do not have faith that will bring salvation. Their faith is not alive. It's lip service. And so we have to ask people, will you be like the nobleman. Will you trust Jesus at his word? And will you be more noble than the majority of the preachers throughout this valley who will try to put up a fight with Jesus? Who would actually try to go as far as to put Jesus against Paul? 
as though they taught two separate, uh, two separate and different things. Will we be like this man who believed Jesus' word 100%? And that Mark's account is not the only account where we have this being laid out for us, even in Matthew's account. It's stated twice in two separate places by two separate speakers. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He has all authority. So what about what he tells us to do? Then we need to believe it. What about with what he tells us in making disciples and to go out and to save the souls of man? He's got 100% authority. We need to believe it. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Why mention baptism if that has nothing to do with your salvation? Why mention baptism if it has no connection to making a disciple? That's the kind of arguments that you'll get from false teachers throughout the valley. Well, baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Baptism has nothing to do with making a disciple. They're disciples before they're baptized. Then why mention it in here? Why does Mark 16, 16 have belief and baptism going collectively so as to bring salvation? Why are you wanting to argue with what Jesus says? Because you don't believe Him. Why mention baptism? Why not just mention belief? If that's what it is. If it's faith alone then why not mention belief in here? Belief isn't in here. Just accept Jesus into your heart. That's not in here. Why not bring up repentance? Why not bring up confession? Baptism is mentioned. The noblemen did not quibble. The nobleman did not argue. He did not push back. Okay, if I believe Jesus who he says he is, then if he says that my son is alive, I'm going home. If Jesus says that this is involved in making a disciple, if this is involved in bringing a person to salvation, then I'm getting in the water. And then we see this being played out, presented by the apostles, the very ones that these things are being spoken to. Mark 16, it's being said to the apostles. Matthew 28, it's being said to the apostles. So what did the apostles do? They took Jesus at His word. Acts 2, 37, And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said, said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That is exactly what Jesus said. Did Peter believe him? Yes, he did. Because Peter preached the sermon without any alteration. Why were these people being baptized? To have their sins forgiven. Their sins were not already forgiven, but some preachers will try to tell you. No, 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 no. Their sins were already being forgiven. They were just being baptized after the fact. It's not what the Word says. That is not what Jesus said was taking place. What are we learning from the noblemen? What are we learning from this sign? We are learning about saving faith. A faith that walks and lives and continues with us in every step of the way of what God asks us.
and this brings us back to the letter to the Ephesians and about that location. Jesus did not have to go to that man's house for the son to be healed. The man simply had to come where Jesus was. You come and be with me and I'll give you what you need. And that is the important role that baptism plays when it comes to us being in that location where those spiritual blessings are. Ephesians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You want these spiritual blessings. You must be in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, In whom, that's in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So just like with that nobleman, here is Jesus, and this is what he's telling us. Here's what I have to offer you. You have redemption. You have the forgiveness of sins, and that is in me. Well, then that raises the question, how does a person get into Christ? You must have faith. Because without faith, it does not matter what you do. God is not going to bless that. And so Paul wrote to the Galatian brethren, reminding them of what they did to be in Christ. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Okay, I am loaded down with the weight of sin, and I want that taken away. Jesus says, come unto me. Come into me. And Paul writes to these brethren, he reminds them, you are in Christ. You do not need to go back to the law of Moses. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So you see, we're right at the same starting point as that noble man. In John chapter 4, he went to Jesus to begin with because he had faith in who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And I need something that he can only give. There's that faith. And faith caused that man to travel 18 miles. Because of that faith in who Jesus is, it then moves us to the next point in verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, I believe what he says. I need to be in him. Jesus says, you want to be in me, you have to be baptized into me. Oh, I just, I just can't do that. I just can't see that. Then you're not going to be redeemed. That's where your faith stops. Your faith, your lack of faith is going to keep you from getting in some water to have all of this taken care of? Well, you must not really believe who He is. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You must be in Christ so as to have this. Well, literally? No, not literally. Jesus does not have to be anywhere literally to bless. Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. 
So what is he talking about? Being in him. What is he talking about? Being in Christ. Where am I needing to be? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. If I am being put into Christ, I'm being put into his body. I'm being put into his church. The day that I am asking him to save me. You are being translated. You are being transported. From being that old man to being a new creature in his kingdom. Colossians 1 verse 13. And that this church and this body has a designation. It identifies itself with Christ. And that if a person is seeking after salvation, the salvation that Christ offers, then you'll be in his body, in his church, which is the church of Christ. Not some division, not some man-orchestrated or man-established organization, but you will be in his body. You will be his possession. And that you will be able to be cleansed with the blood of his sacrifice. And that's God's simple plan. That's all that he asks. Is to hear the message that would be taught. To believe on that message, have faith in that. To be willing to repent of a past life of sin. To be willing to confess Him as being the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the King. And that you put Him on in baptism. To be buried as He was buried. To die to sin so that you may be raised to walk in newness of life. And then strive to be obedient until death. That is why we have this event of the nobleman recorded for us. Because he is a picture of what it takes to have the blessing of salvation from God. Faith starts it all, but it does not end with faith. Faith is the start of the process. But faith traveling all the way through the rest of what it is that God requires. And the blessing is given. None of it is earned. None of it is desired. None of it is merited. The only thing that we deserved was death. Punishment for sins that were committed. But God in His grace and His mercy stepped in and said, I'll offer a way out. I'll offer a way of escape. If you'll just simply believe, if you'll obey, what I've asked and of course as we've studied in previous sermons in our Bible classes this goes beyond just the essential act of salvation and becoming a Christian this same mentality carries over when it comes into our marriages Jesus has laid out very clear instructions as to how to have a happy marriage Will we accept what he says? Will we follow what he says? Or will we try to find our own way?
how to successfully raise children, how to get along in the community. All of these things that Jesus has taught finds its application in every realm of our life. Do we believe him to be who he truly is? Well, yes. Okay, then live how he says you're supposed to live. So with today being a new day and the start of a new week, if it is the case that in some realm of your life you've been kicking against what Jesus has been teaching, you know, it's time to stop that. And instead, let's be like this nobleman. All right, he's the son of God. He has authority. And I'm just going to do what he says. And you know what? Let's see if things don't improve. So we offer at this time the Lord's invitation that if anybody has a need, that you come as we stand.